Uh, we serve uh, 50,000 kids a year uh, in school programs. We have over 200 public programs, which range from pretty much garden shows, farmers markets. We have farms in our collection of properties. Uh, that's the Codman Estate in Lincoln in the bottom right. There's antique car shows every year there. And our archives, our, our collections facility actually is in Haverhill. Uh, and you can see it's 18th century dresses, paintings, chairs, uh, everything from ashtrays to coffee cups, anything that has to do with daily life in New England. And I always kind of like to point out the slide on the, the bottom right uh, where you see the chairs, people will go through, you can do tours of our collections facility and they'll look at those chairs and they'll say, they're all tattered, why don't they get restored? Well, that original fabric is more important to historic New England than making it look good. So uh, the textiles are part of the collection. So a lot of the furniture doesn't look as pretty as we'd like, but it's uh, definitely in its authentic condition. And then we have our archives in our library, which is in Boston. Uh, it's in the basement of the Otis House, which is right near MGH, which is uh, where I'm based. And there, uh, over a million different items of ephemera, cards, photographs, magazines, uh, you'll find probably your Maytag 1974 dishwasher manual in the archives there. Everything that has to do with home life in New England. Uh, so uh, let's get into the hurricane. And I wanted to start by saying a little bit, I, I think it's appropriate to say, you know, Robert and I chatted a little bit about, you know, talking about a disaster based on the current uh, climate of what we're all experiencing right now, uh, you know, gave a little bit of pause for question, but you know, when I really look at what this lecture is. Well, I can, at least I can hear it. <laughs> you can hear it. Can you not see? Oh, I'm sorry. All right, everybody okay? Robert, everything? Is everything okay, Robert? Yeah, I'm here, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. Okay, I'm sorry, I thought something happened and we lost connection or something, so. All right, sorry about that, We're, folks, here we go. Keep going, sorry about that. Oh, no problem. <laughs> this, is only, this is only my third Zoom, Michael, so. No, I, that's okay, I just, I heard somebody talking and I thought maybe yes. we lost connection or something, so that's absolutely fine, no problem. But I, I did want to kind of address the fact that, uh, you know, talking about a, a, a disaster of this scale in today's climate seemed, uh, you know, gave us a little moment of pause, but I really think that uh, there's so much in this that you're gonna see that is so relatable to what's going on today that I think it almost is more than appropriate and to look back in history and see what we've learned and what we haven't, right? Just as importantly. Um, and as we kind of dive into this, a couple disclosures. Uh, I am not a meteorologist. Uh, if there are any meteorologists out there, I would love to hear from you with questions or at the end of the discussion uh, about any thoughts about uh, what was presented tonight. And uh, I am an avid collector of antique clocks. So if you hear any chimes, it's not your ears dinging. There's, there may be a few chimes in the background now and then, uh, probably right at around 7.30. So uh, just uh, I apologize for that in advance, uh, but it takes so much work to get them all running at the same time. I hate to stop them. So um, the hurricane of 1938. Um, so it's gonna be, I think the 82nd anniversary of this hurricane uh, and five years ago, uh, or I'm sorry, seven years ago in 2013, uh, an unsolicited donation arrived at our archives at Historic New England. And it was a scrapbook uh, of all kinds of clippings from the hurricane of 38. And there was a note included which said that uh, someone was going through their mother's house and found the scrapbook in the attic and didn't have the heart to throw it out and thought it was important enough that she would send it to us. And she was right because this event not only impacted certain people in places, it really changed the landscape of historic New England uh, forever and landscape physically and culturally. Uh, so we'll, we'll get into that a little bit later. Um, but it really became in this region, the hurricane that everything else would be measured up to. Uh, unlike a lot of what we're experiencing today, hurricanes don't discriminate. Rich, poor, urban, country, men, women, children, old and young. Right, there's no, uh, it, it affects everybody, 
And you know, the people who lived through it in their testimonials, it's definitely something they'll never forget. It became a really significant chapter in the story of New England. So this slide that you're looking at now is something, uh, this was about a year ago now, um, and I had given the, the lecture back then, but uh, I included this slide because Historic New England, our property care division, sends these out to us uh, as property managers anytime there are storms that are affecting the area so that we can either prepare our properties or check on them and make sure that everything's okay. And I, I thought to myself, this is so commonplace these days, but none of this existed in 1938. And it's an important point to remember because warning is really 90% of the problem in terms of the death toll from this hurricane and so forth, because there just wasn't any, and we'll talk about the reasons why. So um, let's uh, go back to 1938. And there's things happening in the United States, uh, as you can see on the screen, um, in a, a book called Sudden Sea, The Great Hurricane of 1938. Uh, uh, the author, R.A. Scotty notes, there were no freeways, no frozen or fast food, no supermarkets, ballpoint pens, nylon stockings, the 40 hour work week, all things were just coming in. Night ball games were a novelty, that was something new. Air conditioning was a rarity. One in four people were unemployed at the time. One in four workers were unemployed. And 1938, just to kind of put this in perspective, was the last full season that Lou Gehrig would play. And Hitler was threatening to march into Czechoslovakia. And Spain was in its third year of civil war. And the radio was definitely the centerpiece of the American home. So the summer of 1938 wasn't exactly a great weather summer to begin with. There was record rain in June and July, record heat in August, and September brought the wet weather back. So it was very rainy that month. Uh, it would have a huge impact. It rained four days and four nights right up to the hurricane, right? So rivers were already swollen to their maximums uh, in many cases. And the day before the storm hit, uh, many parts of southern New England got drenched with as much as five to six inches of rain. But Wednesday, September 21st, started off mild. The day of the hurricane was actually a nice day. The sun was out. Looking back on it, people noted the morning was almost too perfect. They said there was a strange stillness in the air. There were no birds. The sky had an odd kind of greenish yellow color to it. And quite a few people on the southern New England coast would spend the morning outside, picnicking on beaches uh, for maybe what would be the last time that year that fall. So uh, nobody at all at that time had any idea of what was in store for them. So Robert, I'll check with you real quick and just see if anybody has any questions up to this point or? So uh, Michael, no questions at this point. Okay. So uh, this is a satellite image of Hurricane Floyd. Uh, there are no satellite images of uh, the great New England hurricane, obviously. But uh, just a few weeks earlier, uh, back in 1938 on September 4th, a French meteorologist in the Sahara noted winds moving towards the Atlantic Ocean. And hurricanes uh, that hit the United States, and this is where if there's a meteorologist, I'm hoping all this is correct, but uh, usually begin with the cluster of, of clouds in uh, the waters off of northwestern Africa. And very specific conditions are needed to create a hurricane. Uh, there's an average of 43 created every year. The water has to be approximately or at least 200 feet deep and have a water surface temperature of around 80 degrees Fahrenheit. The cluster of clouds need to be close to the equator, but not too close. There needs to be the right planetary spin, warm weather, uninterrupted seas with no island or volcanic mountains uh, to slow the cluster down. So the conditions are, are very specific. Now, two weeks later, this wind system that was noted, now at hurricane force, was spotted northwest of Puerto Rico. And on September 16th, the Jacksonville office of the National Weather Service in Florida began tracking the hurricane because of weather reporting coming from a Brazilian freighter, right? So you think at the time, ship for really the first uh, mode of response for these. They were the first ones to know that anything was, was really brewing out there at sea. That freighter was reporting 75 mile an hour winds and a barometric pressure of 28.31 uh, inches of mercury and falling which is apparently a very alarming uh, because the normal pressure at sea level is about 30 uh, HG. And I think that's, I'm not even sure what HG is. Maybe somebody knows, but uh, I have that abbreviated here. So, uh, but at full strength, the hurricane is a low pressure system that releases more energy in one day 
than the US consumes in electric power in six months. So that gives you kind of a sense of the force of it. And those tracking the storm felt that there was a very strong possibility that it would hit Southern Florida. So going back a few years earlier, uh, in 1935, the great Labor Day hurricane of Florida killed over 400 people. Uh, and the Jacksonville office wanted to do everything it could to prevent that disaster from occurring again. So in 1938, on Monday, September 19th, it looked as if the storm would hit Florida in a category five. A hurricane warning was issued and emergency services were all put in place in Florida. But by Tuesday, it was clear that the hurricane was not gonna hit Florida. So after sending a warning to the Carolinas, the Jacksonville office of the National Weather Bureau passed the responsibility for tracking the storm to the Washington DC office. The system was moving north. Meteorologists felt that it would take the path of most hurricanes in that area. It would move out northeast over the Atlantic where cold waters would diminish the wind power. So the National Weather Bureau at the time was very different than it is now. Uh, it was originally charted in 1870 uh, within the Army as an act of Congress, and its purpose was to really benefit commerce, right, the shipping lanes. And 20 years later, it would become a civilian agency, and power would transfer to the Department of Agriculture. By becoming a civilian agency, uh, there was a central DC office forecasting branches in, and there were forecasting branches in Jacksonville, New Orleans, and San Juan. So meteorologists relied on volunteers who were reporting data. And at the time, there were no scientists on staff, no formal training procedures for people working at the National Weather Bureau. They relied on observations, if you can believe it, the 16th century thermometer, the 17th century mercurial barometer, and a weather vane. That's what they were using to predict the weather. So when it comes to the 1938 hurricane, the story has often been told of a junior forecaster in the DC office named Charlie Pierce, who actually accurately predicted the hurricane's path. But the chief forecasters overruled them as being young and, young and inexperienced. So there was somebody in the office actually saying this is gonna happen, and everybody else basically said, it's not possible for that to happen based on how we're looking at things. So on the 20th, the hurricane was actually downgraded to a tropical storm. And by the time the forecasters realized the storm was moving north and not losing steam over the Atlantic, the hurricane had already hit land. So there are a few warning signs that should have told the forecasters uh, the path the storm would take. So a ship off the Virginia coast reported uh, that a barometric reading that was low of 27.85, which indicated the storm was close to the coast, closer to the coast than was believed at the time. There was a low pressure front hovering over the Allegheny Mountains, which turned the Northeast into a steam bath, right? Very hot and humid weather. And there was a high pressure system over the North Atlantic, which meant the storm had nowhere to go except towards New England. So if you're looking at the, the image on the screen, if you look at the top image, that's the path that most hurricanes would take. They would veer towards the coast of North America and then head back out to sea. What we're seeing on the, the bottom half of the screen is the scenario that actually forced the hurricane into the coast of New York, uh, New Jersey, and New England. So why didn't forecasters believe that the storm would hit New England, right? Their lack of meteorological tools was one reason, but it was common belief at the time that hurricanes just didn't hit New England, right? They were a tropical force. So no one alive in 1938 had lived through either of the last two hurricanes that hit New England, one in 1635 and one in 1815. Those hurricanes were not imprinted in anybody's memory at all. The storm of 1815, which wiped out all the trees that was once uh, densely populated Rhode Island forest and flooded Providence, was eerily similar to this storm that would strike in 1938. Uh, so most hurricanes have three major weapons, wind, rain, and waves, and we're going to talk about a couple more. This hurricane had a couple more surprises for everybody, uh, which uh, nobody was expecting. Robert, any questions up to this point? Or? Uh, no questions, Michael, but um, back from a, several slides ago, you, you weren't sure about that, um, I don't know, acronym or, or yep. uh, measurement there. Uh, Jeffrey and Milton think that that had to do with mercury, inches of mercury. Okay. Right, and there is a note about mercury. I'm just not sure if HG is some kind of 
grade or must be some kind of grade, I'm guessing, but I'm sorry for not knowing that. But, uh, but thank you very much for, uh, for, for chiming that in. <clears throat> so in Boston, on the morning of September 21st, you had been reading the newspaper about James Michael Curley winning the Democratic primary for governor, the Sox beating the St. Louis Browns in a doubleheader sweep, and Hitler's annexation of the Sudetenland, right? That's what was going on basically in the headlines. The next business day, uh, it, uh, the hurricane hit the Northeast, when the hurricane hit the Northeast, the New York Times printed an editorial, and this is an excerpt from that, uh, praising the National Weather Bureau for the work they did keeping Florida up to date. So I'm, I'm guessing this is probably one of the worst timed editorials ever, right? That <laughs> They were praising the Weather Bureau for uh, giving such good warning about this hurricane, which never happened. But it didn't just affect Southern New England. Um, by mid-morning, uh, the New Jersey shore was feeling the effects with heavy rains and wind causing significant damage. So New York City got hit with the western edge of the storm, and there was flooding, massive blackouts, down trees, damaged buildings. It halted the U.S. open semifiles. The Empire State Building swayed four inches, but the storm's eye passed over Long Island. So the winds of a northbound hurricane, if you can imagine it swirling, are strongest to the east. So communities to the east of the storm's eye would have gotten hit the hardest. That meant the southern shore of Long Island uh, is, is the area that really got hit. And by 2 p.m. it was clear that something ominous was really approaching. Clouds were racing by, the wind was really getting fierce, and the sea looked very, very angry. At 2.30 p.m. the storm came ashore. Uh, no more than 45 minutes later, it was hitting Long Island with all of its power. So besides suffering from heavy winds and rain, the southern tip of Long Island was devastated by storm, storm surges. And many people who went outside for the sole purpose of watching the awesome sea were actually swept away and swallowed up by these very unexpected and fast moving walls of water. So damage from a hurricane usually comes, we said, in wind, rain, and waves. Uh, but these storm surges are really another huge impact, and this particular hurricane uh, was especially um, inclined to produce those terrible storm surges. So they occur because the wind hit the water with such force that a wave doesn't have the time to ebb before the next wave comes in. So tens of uh, thousands of tons of water keep getting pushed further and further onto shore. So storm surges alone are what really account for about three quarters of all deaths that result from hurricanes. And you know, the density of that force of water, just to give you a sense of it, is about a thousand times more powerful than the force of air. So uh, again, in the tragic thing you can see here, and we'll talk more about uh, some of the rail disasters that happen as a result of the storm. So with winds of 100 miles an hour, uh, the first storm surge to hit Long Island caused tremors to be recorded in Alaska. That's how far away uh, the tremors were felt from the force of that hitting the, the actual uh, continent and it reached about 13 feet high. The eye of the storm actually brought calm for about 20 minutes and people began to believe that things had passed. They began leaving their homes, uh, but as the storm moved in Connecticut, the hurricane bared down again on Long Island uh, with 130 mile an hour winds with up to 18 feet high storm surges. So before the storm, there were 173 houses on West Hampton Beach, and you can see West Hampton there in the picture. Of those 173, only 26 survived the hurricanes. The others completely vanished, and 50 people alone from that town lost their lives. So the storm came up the eastern shore at 50 to 70 miles per hour. No hurricane had ever moved that fast. Beach communities where people had enjoyed the lunch that day no longer existed by dinner. That's how fast this thing moved through. And by 5.30 p.m., the hurricane left Long Island, leaving in its wake devastation and earning its nickname the Long Island Express. So the storm began banging on New England's door almost as soon as it reached New York. The hurricane had a span of 500 miles across. On average, most hurricanes are approximately 300 miles wide, right? So it gives you a sense of how big this was. So Bridgeport and New Haven, Connecticut were hit very hard, but like New York City, they did not feel the full weight of the storm. Once again, it was the southern portion of the state that caught the storm's uh, full brunt, and communities began Sabre Point and Stonington had massive damage. 
New London was the first city to experience the full force of the hurricane. Uh, in, it struck the city at 3 p.m. and stayed there for three hours. In addition to the wind, rain, and storm surges, New London, like a lot of communities throughout southern New England, had to cope with inland rivers overflowing and flooding. And if that weren't enough, uh, the five-masted Barkentine Marsal blew out of the water, crossed over railroad tracks, and hit the corner of the Humphrey Cornell building with the water and wire short-circuiting, a massive fire spread. So we talked about these other kind of surprises from this hurricane, right? There's the storm surges, and now on top of everything else, they're dealing with massive fires. So it was reported to the fire department at 4.30 p.m., and it was really a, a bad situation for these first responders, for these firefighters, because the wind spread the fire from building to building, right? That wind was blowing like crazy. Trees were down, phone lines were down and cut, and travel was near impossible. So people were wading through water with downed electric lines and fires burning, and it really must have been uh, quite uh, horrific to experience uh, all that as these uh, electrical and water lines were snapping. So even with the recruitment of every able-bodied person, the Coast Guard and the Fire Department uh, of neighboring towns, it was 2 a.m. before the fire was contained. And for the next week, the entire city enforced a curfew of 8 p.m. Now we're gonna get a little bit more into this, but one of the other big things that happened back then is when all those power lines went down and all communications went out, even though the storm was hitting land, communities had no way of warning the next community that this was coming. Right, which is also a, a huge problem and a, a reason that everybody was caught so unawares. So a month later, the New London Day reported, after the storm, the city more than anything else resembled a large community in a war zone, which had just undergone a terrific shelling by big guns of the enemy. Trees, poles, walls, roofs, chimneys, homes were shattered, vessels on all sides were hurled to, destruct hurled to destruction or sunk, wharves were leveled, uh, sea walls torn away, roads and sidewalks undermined, and entire summer colonies destroyed. Um, so I'm sure everybody recognizes this famous face, but uh, Catherine Hepburn uh, on that day in 1938 was at her family's beach house in Fenwick, Connecticut when the hurricane hit. And uh, Fenwick, uh, I wasn't uh, personally familiar with where exactly it is, but it's where the Long Island Sound and the mouth of the Connecticut River meet. Uh, you know, and at this point in her life, her career had taken a little bit of a dip, and she was waiting to hear if she had won the role of Scarlett O'Hara in Gone with the Wind, uh, which we know didn't work out, but she was also reviewing the final draft of the play, The Philadelphia Story, which we know did. But she spent the morning on that 21st, you know, she was known to be very active, swimming, playing golf. Uh, you know, if you remember, the weather was fine in the morning, and she was just getting out of the ocean after her daily swim when the storm came upon her. By the time she reached her house, which was just a few steps away, the ocean was already pouring onto the front lawn. So her house began tearing apart. Chimneys collapsed, screens and windows blew away, laundry wing was pulled off the house. Uh, and basically she held up with her mother, a brother, and a family friend in the house uh, who tied themselves together with the rope as the water started pouring in the house. They eventually had escaped through the dining room window and when they got to higher ground, they saw their house sail away. And I love this quote because I'm absolutely positive she said it, but quoting Catherine Hepburn, in such a dignified manner. You hear her saying that. But all of their uh, possessions were gone, carried away by water. And the next day as they were going through the rubble, they found a complete set of the mother's flatware and silver tea set. Uh, and the house that you see on the screen is a rebuilt house that the Hepburns built on the same site. So houses through Old Saybrook were thrown off their foundations and smashed to pieces. And you can kind of see through uh, looking at that image there. Uh, and I, I do want to say as we get into some of these images, if some of them look a little washed out and foggy, they're actually from original 1938 materials. A lot of them are from those news clippings. So if they're a little blurry and fuzzy, I apologize for that. Uh, and thanks for your understanding there. Um, other coastal towns, uh, Lyme and East Lyme you see here, devastated. Railroad tracks twisted, thrown off their beds, uh, boats flattered about and flung on shore, and telephone wires completely down. So there's a couple uh, kind of famous stories that came out of this hurricane, uh, stories of survival and non-survival. 
Um, but it's important, I think, to tell them, even though sometimes they don't always have happy endings, because it really uh, gives a sense of the human element of this story, right? The storm is a major character, but it's a really human story. And for example, one of those stories is that at 11 a.m., uh, the train, which was known as the Bostonian, left Grand Central Station with 275 passengers heading for Boston with stops in Connecticut, Rhode Island, and eventually arriving in Back Bay Station. So the train was filled with students traveling to prep school or college. And by the time the train left New Haven, the engineers and everybody else on the train could really tell that something was happening. So when the train left the New London station at four o'clock, forceful winds and rains had engulfed the train. The train cleft along a narrow causeway built on gravel that was weakened by the rain that had previously been occurring. And with the sea rising on one side and a salt, salt pond bubbling on the, on the geyser on the other, uh, it must have been a pretty uh, terrifying scene to be looking out the windows. The Pullman cars, which weighed 67 tons, were swaying about, and the water on both sides was getting higher and higher. But most passengers didn't start getting truly alarmed until the windows began shattering. So the conductor went through each cabin asking passengers to sit on the inland side of the train. Uh, but the big problem wasn't the windows, it was the fact that the rail bed was disappearing right before the train. So by 4.30 p.m., the parlor car had only its front wheels on the track. There were no rails or ties beneath it. So the staff decided the best course of action, rather than just wait for a large wave to come and push the train over, was to move everybody to the front cars uh, and cut off the rest of the cars and then speed to the next station, right? So they were basically going to cut off the back half of the train and try and make it through without it. So people poured down the aisles, shoving their way through. I can imagine the panic. Some began deserting the train and trying to swim to safety, leaping from windows. Uh, crew squeezed as many people as possible into the engine car, and the rest stayed in the front car. Those who ended up in the water had to deal with the terrifying undertow that dragged them down, as well as pieces of boats, houses, and branches swirling around them. So this gives you a pretty indication of what they were facing there. Uh, of course, this is taken after the fact, so it's not in the midst of everything that was going on. But passengers clung to cables, baggage racks, anything they could. Uh, and if it, won't, it wasn't bad enough being in the train, people were witnessing the hapless situations of the people who had jumped out. So uh, a large tree hit the train's air hose, which jammed the emergency brakes if things weren't bad enough. So the people in the train were basically sitting ducks waiting to be pulled into the water. And brakeman named Bill Donahue plunged into water, shutting off the compression and uncoupled the last few cars allowing the train to keep moving forward. So after four attempts, the cars finally began to move, dragging telegraph wires, telephone poles behind it, and finally reached Stonington Station. So amazingly, there were only two fatalities from this disaster, uh, an elderly woman uh, and the pantryman, Chester Walker, who was thought to have been hit uh, by a piece of uh, rogue timber. Anybody have any thoughts or comments or questions? Uh, we do have a question. Um, did they name uh, hurricanes back then and how long did it last over New England? Right, so uh, it's my understanding that they did not name hurricanes back then. Uh, this one had kind of the, the nomaker of the Long Island Express, uh, but it was referred to as it is today as the hurricane of 1938 or the Great Hurricane or the New England Hurricane, but not as we name them today. And uh, we're going to get into New England. Uh, the thing moved pretty quickly. So it was really just a matter of uh, this all happened very quickly over about a day that it swept through. Remember, it was moving, you know, somewhere so quickly uh, that it that's one of the reasons it did so much damage is nobody had any warning. So uh, we'll have some time frames as we get further into the talk. Uh, also, Michael, a um, uh, question, uh, did this happen uh, in Mystic, was the, is the question. Yeah, there, were, there was really no place in New England that wasn't affected. Uh, you know, most of the images here are from our archives, and one of the things I was going to ask is that many of you may have, uh, through family scrapbooks or, or anything, images from where you live. Uh, I looked for images from your local area that we don't happen to have in our archives that weren't in the scrapbook. Uh, but there was really, uh, Maine was, I think, the least affected by it. When we look back at the path, it kind of went up through Massachusetts and then into New Hampshire. Uh, but there were very few areas of coastal uh, Connecticut, Massachusetts, uh, and Long Island that weren't affected. 
Okay. Yep. We're good. Yep. Okay. So now getting into uh, into a little further into Connecticut, uh, but even beyond the coast, inland towns were devastated, right? So we talked about the the, the coast uh, due to flooding. Uh, and this happened even before the hurricane hit. We talked about uh, the rivers overflowing, right? And this was happening before those storm surges or that additional amount of, of rain. Uh, the winds caused rivers and basins to carry more than their capacity. Uh, in addition, the rain that plagued New England days before meant that the existing moist conditions helped the storm maintain its power, right? The grounds were already soaked. Uh, all the rivers uh, in Connecticut, uh, the, the Naugatuck wreak havoc on the rivers. So 100-year-old trees that were already drenched in soil were like weighing nothing. They blew over, crashing into cars, crashing into buildings, crashing into streets. Uh, and the storm hit Hartford by 4 p.m., right? So you can see how fast this is pretty moving. I mean, we're going on an almost an hour-by-hour hour timeline here. So by midnight, the Connecticut River reached 24 feet high, and boats were needed to patrol the city, right? I mean, you can see there, uh, 7,000 people need to be evacuated. And two days later, the water began to recede. Uh, ironically, Hartford had very little flood insurance. And I know that gets, usually gets a chuckle or two, but at the time, it was a, a fact. And all of the trees on Wesleyan University's campus in Middletown were destroyed. Apple orchards, uh, other crops completely obliterated. Uh, so we're going to talk a little bit later about the economic effects of this. Uh, and 3,000 acres of tobacco fields uh, in the town of Windsor alone were decimated. Barns were flattened. Uh, factories were ripped apart, churches were torn in pieces. Uh, after the local dam gave way, uh, which you can see on the left there, workers in Springfield, Woolen Mills, and Rockville escaped through the windows. Uh, and following the hurricane, many towns warned their residents to boil all drinking water and receive emergency inoculations. Uh, and areas were in the dark for days, right? I mean, there was no way to restore power to any of these areas. So you can already see one deadly aspect of the storm, right? Uh, no one hit by it could warn other communities. We talked about that a little bit earlier. Uh, and nobody can let anybody else know that a massive hurricane was heading right towards them. So the storm left a very dark and silent path behind it. Telegraph and phone lines were completely destroyed, power outages everywhere, and few people could leave and even get out of the cities that they were in. So Rhode Island at this point, right, we've go going through Connecticut, had no idea what was coming, right? All this had already happened on Long Island in Connecticut and Rhode Island is still enjoying their last days of, uh, of or mid fall there, last days of summer. So the geography of Rhode Island uh, meant the hurricane would overwhelm it more than any other state. Uh, Narragansett Bay is the largest bay in New England, 30 miles long and two to three miles wide. Uh, at its head is Providence, and at the entrance is Jamestown and Newport, as you can see on the map. And in between Narragansett Bay and Little Narragansett Bay, which is, you can see my little arrow over here, um, is right where uh, the Connecticut Rhode Island uh, state line is. And in South County there, uh, this barrier beach with lots of coastal towns all up and down, and we're going to see some more detailed maps here. So the coastal towns were really the most devastated, some being completely wiped out and many never even being rebuilt again. And that's uh, 1938 would have been a very familiar scene on one of New England's beaches uh, you know, in, in September. So here's a little more of a detailed map and showing the barrier beaches, which are these strips of land here that kind of uh, protect the mainland from the open ocean. Um, but they're always very low lying and there's strips of beach that are they're parallel to the mainland, but they form a buffer between the mainland and the ocean, which makes them a prime target. So one of the things that made the hurricane so disastrous was that it hit New England during high tide, during the autumnal equinox, that's when the Earth is closer to the moon uh, than any other time of year. So gravitational pull is at its strongest, drawing the ocean even further offshore, upshore. So these were the conditions were exactly right to make this as bad as it could possibly be. So when the water surged onto the beach, uh, it wasn't able to retreat, it just retained its grip. And people who began thinking their day that they might again have one last day at the beach quickly began to prepare their homes as best they could, but no amount of boarded windows, as we're gonna see, could save the houses that were all swallowed up by the storm. So by 4.30 p.m., the beach in westerly Rhode Island 
uh, was overrun with water, wind threw around houses, boats, and cars like they had in Connecticut. Uh, survivors commented the sound was all consuming, this whiny high pitched sound. And incredibly, they couldn't even hear the amount of destruction that was going on because of this high pitched sound that the hurricane makes. So if a house was crashing next door, they wouldn't have even heard uh, those timbers coming down. So uh, unfortunately, uh, I, sometimes people and I wondered what the true speeds of the hurricane were at its highest. Uh, but all the instruments that they were using at the time were destroyed in the hurricane. So nothing survived to tell us what the highest velocity of those winds were, but the Blue Hills Observatory in Massachusetts uh, recorded before it was destroyed, sustained winds of 121 miles an hour and gusts up to 186 miles per hour. So that's the second highest rate in the Normous Hemisphere that's been recorded. So many people were in their homes. Uh, they raced up to try and escape rising waters. Uh, this is Watch Hill, which is in that southern coast of Rhode Island. Uh, a family uh, by the name of Moore had just begun to do this. Mr. Moore uh, was at home with his wife, uh, four children, three servants, had actually suffered a heart attack earlier that day. And as the wind and water began to intensify, he actually disobeyed his doctor's orders, got out of bed, and started nailing all the shutters closed on the house. Uh, but all for naught. The water was soon pouring into their living room. And uh, one of the children, Anne, remembered thinking her dad, she described it, was not only trying to keep the front door shut, but he felt like he was trying to keep the ocean out of their house. So from a child's perspective, um, I think that's kind of a, an interesting uh, memory. So waves crashed over the house, ceilings collapsed, floors collapsed, and the group finally ended up, made their way up to the attic. Uh, they climbed onto it, but the, soon the roof broke off and the attic started floor started floating in the ocean. So they found themselves in their attic, basically, which now became a raft. Uh, so waves continued to crash upon them. Uh, there were sharks in the water, they reported. Uh, and, you know, of course, others were not so lucky. They eventually made it uh, to land to Barn Island. Uh, but uh, thinking that they might be without heat for a night, many people dressed in layers right, thinking that they were gonna keep warm, but these extra clothes actually proved to be a detriment because it actually weighed people down in the water. So uh, another gentleman by the name of Thomas Mee in Charlestown Beach with his wife, son, daughter, and their uh, um, uh, house attendant, uh, their maid the day of the hurricane rushed back from Woonsocka where he worked to take care of his family, um, but they decided to move inland and drive in the pouring rain but many people would later comment that the speed of this destruction was so incredible that you couldn't outdrive it. Moment, moment, people were laughing and enjoying the rough ocean. The next minute, they were under 20 or 30 feet of water. So uh, some of the houses just, based someone had commented, they just blew away like feathers, uh, up to 75 feet in the air. Uh, but Charlestown, like many of those uh, barrier beaches, had only one road that paralleled the ocean and no high ground to flee to. So the only way out was to drive parallel to the coast. And as these roads started to flood, you can imagine that there was really no escaping it. So other degree uh, fell, uh, continued to, uh, to, to fall. Uh, the car uh, was basically blown off the causeway. Uh, the passengers got out of the car as quickly as possible. Uh, and by this time, the water was waist high. Uh, so they formed a chain holding hands and what looked like kind of a big polluted lake completely surround them. Uh, you know, to give you a sense of the force of this again, there was salt spray from these waves that were carried 10 miles, right? That's how hard the wind was blowing. And even with Mr. Me holding on to his family for life, uh, unfortunately, they were pulled from his grasp. So as he put it after the fact, he said, I was tossed beneath the water and kept going down and down and down. And then I started to come to the surface. It seemed like an eternity. When I reached the top, I looked around and there was no one in sight. Debris struck me from all sides as I was hurled wildly along with the waves. Finally, I landed on the shore of Green Hill Pond. I staggered to my feet, but the force of the wind knocked me down time and time again. His dog, who's in the car, miraculously survived, but Mr. Me sadly lost his wife and children. So he stayed in Charlestown uh, at the makeshift morgue for days, refusing to leave. Uh, but uh, only the body of his six-month daughter, Jean, would be recovered, right? None of the bodies of his family, a very sad story, were actually recovered. 
So as I said, you know, this day started off like so many others with no warning of this to come. So you can imagine the shock, right, of, of what was experienced. You know, children went off to school that morning uh, and school was just getting out when this was actually hitting Rhode Island. So in Jamestown, uh, which is this little island right at the beginning of, of uh, the, the bay, um, parents usually let their children walk home from school. Uh, the, some kids rely on the school bus, and as usual, the bus, bus left school at 3 p.m. that day, heading towards Beaver Tail, which is this part of Jamestown down here on the southern tip of it. Uh, and to get there, they have to go across this little causeway, which is this little kind of bridge of land right here that's connecting the two pieces of land. So um, the bus reached the causeway. By the time it reached the causeway leaving the school, the wind was so fierce, visibility was nearly impossible. And a gentleman by the name of Joseph Mateo Sr. had tried to pick up his four children from school, but missed getting the bus by 10 minutes. So he headed back to his farm on Beaver Tail, but wasn't able to get any further across the causeway to get back to his kids. So uh, with cars stalled along the causeway, um, things weren't looking very good for uh, the bus. So when Mr. Mateo reached the edge of his farm. He could just see clearly the bus attempting to cross the causeway. Uh, he waved his arms frantically, trying to warn the bus driver, uh, whose name was Norm Caswell, to turn back, but it was too late. Water was up to the hubcaps of the bus by now, and Caswell had to try to barrel through. The engine stalled, like the other cars on the causeway, and he couldn't get it to turn over. The winds by this time were blowing 100 miles an hour, and Caswell felt it was better for the children to be outside rather than trapped in the bus that was rocking nonstop. So all of the eight children on the bus were there with a sibling, right? They were all either brothers and sisters or, or pairs of siblings. Uh, the, Mr. Mateo had four of his own children there, uh, as well as other children. And survivors would talk later of how siblings looked after one another, helping each other out of the bus, uh, holding on to one another. So uh, imagine uh, Mr. Mateo was watching all of this happen. He watched the kids form a line, hold hands, and try and walk away from the bus. Uh, and soon the empty bus, was flung into the cove. So you can see there, uh, there's a picture of Mackerel Cove as a beach community before and what was left after the hurricane. So all too quickly, this storm came and uh, devoured the bathing pavilion that we just saw and closed over the children and the driver, uh, pushed them all onto the roof of the bus and then pulled them down again. Only two people survived, the bus driver and 11-year-old Clayton Chellis, and volunteers searched all night for the rest of the children. Over the next week, all of the bodies except for one would be found. Uh, the Chellises and the Mateos both stayed in Jamestown, but uh, a lot of the other families who were involved fled the area afterwards, uh, not being able to deal with the grief. And uh, the bus driver alone uh, never, never drove again. You can imagine the, the, the trauma of going through that. Um, any questions so far, Robert? Uh, uh, no recent questions, Michael. Nope. Okay. So these are, are some of the heart, you know, probably the most heart-wrenching stories of the hurricane. You know, they're, they're hard for me to tell every time, but again, they really show the human impact of the storm. Um, so, you know, to give you a, just a quick sense and uh, to give you uh, the storm by numbers, you know, 700 houses in Charleston Beach were wiped out. All 39 houses in, in Napa Tree Point were destroyed. Uh, beach communities collapsed entirely and see 400 Rhode Islanders lost their lives. Um, but I think that uh, it can be really easy to lose sight of these personal stories and the heartache that this hurricane caused. So uh, in just a few hours, the storm really turned everybody's life and New England upside down. So uh, almost all of Rhode Island was impacted by the storm, uh, but mostly South County, that's the area we just talked about. So Newport, uh, the Grand Cottages in Newport, for the most part, uh, survived okay. Uh, they were pretty uh, on high ground compared to a lot of those lower line communities, uh, and that saved them from significant damage. Um, lower areas of the city were destroyed, such as Bailey's Beach. Uh, rescue workers went from door to door, uh, offering assistance. The tide made its way up uh, Thames Street, and the steeple of the First Baptist Church was brought down, but compared to what we just saw in uh, Southern Rhode Island, it was not nearly as bad. And um, here's the breakers, and you can see in the upper left, uh, 
this and to the right, those are kind of aerial views before the storm. And the one, uh, let's see, the third circle there on the bottom left is, uh, it's not, it's one of those blurry photographs that was a newspaper photograph, but you can see how many trees are gone on the property, right? If you look behind the house there uh, in this area here, you can see how much really the property was decimated. So the storm ripped through Warwick, uh, leaving 100 people homeless. Um, boats again hurled uh, inland. Uh, it also heavily damaged Bristol, uh, which was cut off from the rest of the world for two days following the storm. Uh, there the water was 15 feet. And now we're getting into Providence by 4 p.m., right? So just a couple hours later, uh, the storm is raging full force in Providence. So the city received a hurricane warning uh, at 3.40 p.m. Uh, the wind damage took its toll. The majority of damage there was due to flooding. Uh, if you can imagine and think back about that map on Narragansett Bay, and now we're at the head of the bay and all that water, that storm surge just pushed up the bay. So uh, the storm surge hit, down, hit downtown Providence about 5.15. Uh, the water roads, electricity failed, cars, furniture, uh, clothes, people all could be found in the water. Uh, and many remember the eerie sound, and this is a kind of a memory that I find especially eerie, of car horns and the glare of the headlights under, underwater. Kind of reminds me of uh, like the images from Titanic, uh, <laughs> but uh, it must have been very eerie. Uh, and you know, this is the time of day, this is 5.15, everybody's just getting off work, right? So the streets are teeming with people. Uh, nobody could have imagined this morning, or that morning when they went to work, that they were gonna be dealing with this by five o'clock this afternoon. So uh, the Providence Bulletin re later reflected that no amount could possibly uh, picture in mind what everybody failed to completely grasp. Uh, downtown Providence under raging water, men diving from signs off a building, people swimming for their lives, uh, the Westminster Street and Exchange Place, uh, all screaming wind that tore through with uh, vicious fingers at the tall buildings and uh, really shook the city to its foundations. So people survived the flood because of cooperation and courage. Uh, stranded people were pulled to safety. Those in high water were rescued. That being said, there were seven fatal fatalities in downtown Providence. Uh, one man was swept into water in the front steps of City Hall. At its highest point, the water reached 14 feet high. So by 10 p.m., the water had begun to recede. So sadly, looters became a problem. You would think in this type of disaster, we did have that uh, essence of cooperation, but uh, there also looting became a problem. Um, and almost like it had been planned, it started happening so fast, people started carrying off everything they could. Uh, the National Guard by midnight was called in to patrol the streets with an actual order of shoot to kill. And Rhode Island remained under martial law for weeks following the hurricane. So it would be two weeks before traffic returned to downtown Providence and business started to return to normal. So by 5 p.m., storm surges and powerful winds were hitting Massachusetts shore from Horseneck Beach to Buzzards Bay. And there you can see an image of Buzzards Bay post hurricane. So Horseneck Beach had 30 foot high waves and the beach was swept clean. 23 people died in Westport. So here to give you a sense is the neighborhood in East Beach before the hurricane. And there's that same area after. So you can see the complete devastation. Now the building remains and people living in this area were trapped by the incoming sea on one side and marshes on the other. So factories were shut down in New Bedford. Uh, people became homeless. Uh, you can see New Bedford, Wareham there, uh, Falmouth the devastation. Out of the 170 houses uh, in uh, Mattapoisett, only 10 could survive the storm's fury. 41 people in the Greater Falls River area lost their lives. Fishing villages were destroyed, yacht clubs. Again, nothing being spared. So under the Sagamore Bridge, uh, three elderly women, a mother and her 11-year-old son, were trapped on the second floor of a house and drowned. And rescue workers had cut uh, a hole in the roof to retrieve the bodies. Uh, so the house was originally located two miles south. And that's one of my digging clocks. Are we nearing on eight o'clock here already? Your, your clock is two minutes fast, Michael. Okay, all right. We'll keep going here for the next couple minutes and then uh, hopefully have a couple minutes for questions. 
Uh, let's see here. So, um, you know, Boston's main problem um, began uh, at 5 p.m. Uh, the Constitution broke free. Arnold Arboretum, you can see the damage there. Uh, South Boston, you can see those trees lost over in the wind. Um, there's images there from Dorchester with ships turning over. You can see those uh, uh, images from Cambridge uh, with trees down, pieces of roofs missing. Uh, Fenway completely uh, a mess. And uh, this is the Codman estate where that car show was earlier. Uh, you can see the ancestral trees of, you know, these historic homes that have been around for hundreds of years uh, were basically decimated. And again, these are more images of the Lyman estate. This is in Waltham. So, you know, we talk about being inland and the damage that was done. You can kind of see uh, how much damage was there. So, you know, it took weeks, if not months, for workers to clean up uh, all this tree, the trees and debris. Uh, and, you know, the damages to those estates could have been worse, uh, but, uh, you know, these generations of families that had had these estates for hundreds of years uh, really uh, worked to try and, you know, restore what they had lost. So in central and western Massachusetts, massive flooding, mostly due to the overflowing rivers, became a huge problem. Again, factories, roads sinking, bridges out. Uh, the high tension towers of the Turner's Falls Power and Electric Company in East Hampton were knocked down. Uh, so uh, this uh, storm isolated towns even in the Berkshires for days. Um, where Massachusetts was cut off for days, much like Connecticut, crops and livestock had a huge toll. Uh, families being rescued from rivers and flooding areas. Uh, you can see they were using carrier pigeons to get information back and forth, which I always think is kind of interesting. Uh, and New Hampshire also has significant flooding and wind damage. Uh, fires in, in Peterborough and other areas. You can kind of see there that going on. That clock, uh, Michael, is going slow. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> all right. That one's slow. I know. I warned you that they're all not going to be the same. So uh, we're winding down here towards the end. But uh, a quick Take shot of time. Lake Winnipesaukee. Pardon me? Take your time. Okay. The, the, uh, a shot of Lake Winnipesaukee here, and you can see the before and the after, right? So the house is still there, but what was completely secluded, uh, everything before it was completely uh, washed away. So the storm continued up into Vermont, uh, which is why earlier we had said that Maine was really spared of all the New England uh, states uh, because it didn't take that path. Uh, but the storm uh, reached Burlington, Vermont, uh, and there was flood damage, but by now a lot less powerful than what Rhode Island, Connecticut, and the Massachusetts coast had experienced. So uh, towns throughout New England were battling elements for the days to come. Uh, rivers took a while to recede. So, you know, once the storm passed, it wasn't like everything was over. Uh, downtown Providence flooded again on Thursday due to rivers and rain. Uh, so they were pumping out uh, water. So most uh, estimates uh, are that 600 to 700 people died because of this 1938 hurricane. Uh, Maine was the only state with no fatality. Um, but, uh, you know, again, we talk about insurance these days, only 5% of property loss in 1938 was covered by insurance. Uh, so uh, half of all New Hampshire white pine was wiped out. Um, it ended the state's lumber industry. Fallen timber covered 35% of area in land, in all of New England land. Uh, so you can see the devastation was so widespread. Uh, Building lumber and firewood that were salvaged, you can imagine how much there was that they were able to salvage, uh, lasted until 1980, if you could believe it. So wood that they had uh, collected and salvaged from that hurricane, they were still using in 1980. And the uh, uh, US Forest Service estimated that enough lumber was filled to build 200,000 five-room houses. So that's how much uh, trees were laying on the ground. Uh, and here's two examples. The chair on the left, you can see, was made from uh, wood. Uh, behind the bottom of the chair is marked uh, a souvenir of the New England hurricane. And then on the right, you can see uh, the room, uh, which is the Northeastern Mass, was constructed from 1938 uh, Hurricane Pine. So, um, you know, it, it's, it's certainly no, uh, the, the loss of life and, you know, these type of stories of creating, you know, there's no comparison, but uh, it's, it's such a, uh, with such a horrific and long-term uh, effects after the hurricane. 
So elements that were typically New England that we're so used to seeing were just destroyed. So fishing boats, you know, trees that have been there since when the pilgrims landed here, uh, church steeples, you know, just gone without a trace. Uh, new maps had to be drawn. You can see uh, Napa Tree Point above, before, and look how much wider the land mass got there, that barrier line, and the hurricane basically reshaped the coastline. So uh, the New Deal made recovery possible, right? Um, the Workers' Progress Administration, the WPA, began hiring uh, people on payrolls. Uh, so uh, Federal Power Commission sent engineers to help restore power. Uh, there's pictorial history of the disaster. Um, you know, there was a huge risk of the, of the timber market being flooded with all that extra lumber now. So uh, they were salvaging lumber and trying to put uh, things in, in place that would limit the amount of lumber and, and for, uh, to control prices. So it, it not only affected lives and the geography, but it really affected local uh, and national communities and national politics. Um, it really showed us that, you know, governments uh, you know, really before this, we're not just there to protect our rights, but to help protect power, protect, protect people in their greatest hour of need. Um, so, you know, unlike in previous catastrophes, New England and Long Island were built to uh, a lot based on the federal government, not based on local efforts. So uh, changes also take place at, at the Weather Bureau, obviously following this, right? Uh, there was a shakeup. Um, Navy commander was appointed chief. Uh, with better aircraft and radar satellites and a much better understanding of weather patterns today. Um, you know, there's a very little chance that a hurricane of this magnitude could hit the entire region again without any warning. Um, but with that being said, hurricanes are still notoriously hard to predict. So um, even today, they can be within a hundred mile error of where these things hit landfall. So uh, I'm just going to briefly go through this. And uh, if anybody's interested in, in these numbers, I can certainly send them to Robert if you wanted to take a closer look. But if you look at cost and dollars and the damage of the top 10 hurricanes, on the left, you'll see that the hurricane of 1938 doesn't make the list. Uh, but that's because of 1938 dollars compared to 2012 dollars. So if you look on the right, uh, and when things are adjusted for inflation, it's the seventh largest hurricane uh, that's been recorded to hit. Uh, United States. <clears throat> so it's not only, it's a New England story, uh, not only because it happened here, uh, but it didn't really get much coverage in the rest of the country when this happened, right? Hitler's invasion of Czechoslovakia overshadowed this disaster. Um, you know, people in the rest of the country were so preoccupied with what everything else was going on. Um, you know, people commented that they missed seeing how the checks were making out more than how people in New England were doing after this storm. So looking back on it, one could say that this really marked, I think, the end of an era. Um, it was really one of the last, what people refer to as the old New England summers, the old Yankee establishment, so to speak. Um, you know, everything uh, took a new turn after this, uh, a new changing of the guard. Uh, the pace of life began to quicken right uh, after this uh, with technology that started. And uh, really, this, the uh, war, um, the, a, a way of life was really lost forever. I think the storm had a kind of a long lasting effect. So um, that's pretty much all I have to say on this. And I'm happy to, to talk and chat if anybody has any questions. And I'm sorry I, I talked a few minutes longer than I said I was going to. Um, but, uh, you know, this uh, just as, as a kind of wrap up. Um, you know, 10 years, this was written in 2015, 10 years after Katrina, and it kind of caught my eye as I was looking through the topic today a little bit, because, uh, you know, things that happened uh, 10 years after Katrina, you know, they were talking about providing health and safety training for disaster recovery workers, information about protective equipment, investing in stockpiles of food and water, paying attention to at-risk populations, deeper understanding of climate change, all these things uh, 10 years ago, and I always like to put things into context, you know, history gives us plenty of opportunities to do things better. And given to what we're all experienced today, uh, you know, it makes me wonder, are we doing things better, right? Where have we come since uh, 2005, 2015, and now 2020? All right.